All right, so let's get to the story we're talking about. Uh, so I saw this article. So the the New York, look at this article. It says the New York Times executive editor says we were, quote, a little tiny bit flat-footed with the Mueller coverage. <laughs> now, those, that's quite a qualifier. We are... Uh, and that's, of course, I, I brought on uh, uh, Aaron to talk about this because he's the award winning. He's the only guy who won an award debunking Russiagate. And uh, but so why? So I'm going to set it up why he came to say this. So the New York Times has been messing up heavier than normal uh, lately. Like, like they've had to get their Washington editor to step down because he went mental on Twitter. Did you see that? <laughs> yeah. Did you see that? They're, they're, yeah. Roxanne they're, they're editor, yeah. not some low-level reporter. The guy they put in charge in D.C. is loco. Legit crazy. <laughs> That's the guy they put in charge. <laughs> Brett, again, not some low-level idiot who wrote a story. No, the guy in charge in D.C. for the is whew, had to get him, had to give him a straitjacket and get him out of there. Uh so then uh after the El Paso shooting, Trump gave a speech. And now Trump is very famous for being a race baiter. And uh, lots of people call him a racist. I certainly do. I think his he has a history of uh, racism. That's what I'm talking about, his history of discriminating against people and what have you. And uh, that's what I'm talking about. Um, and so the New York Times published this headline after he gave a speech about the El Paso shooting. It said, Trump urges unity versus racism. And oh, my God. All people went nuts, right? So here's uh, Nate Silver even said that he was upset with it, said that's not the headline I would use. Uh, then Alexandria Ocasio Cortez says, Let this front page serve as a reminder of how white supremacy is aided by and often relies upon the cowardice of mainstream institutions. Even <laughs> Cory Booker jumped in. He said, Lives literally depend on you doing better. New York Times, please do. Okay, so now everybody who voted for Hillary will tell you that they're, they're being right wingers saying that because you can't, you're not allowed to criticize the, the corporate news or you're considered a Trumper, right? That's what. So that, but but people didn't care if they got called a Trumper and they criticized the New York Times for doing bad work. And guess what happened? The New York Times switched the headline, and the headline now says "Assailing Hate, but Not Guns," because they talk they took enough heat. So then. The the editor of the New York Times held a like a town hall with his own newsroom, right? Which uh, you know I I worked in a newsroom, uh, and that that could be very helpful. I could see how that would be helpful to have a town hall in your own newsroom to clear shit up, right? I could see how that could be helpful. Um, uh, so this is this is what Slate wrote about it. Okay, I just want to. So I'm going to talk about. The reason why he called the meeting in the first place, which is about those headlines and how they're going to cover Trump. And we're going to get around to Buzzsaw Mate and, and why <laughs> and what they said about the Mueller report. So it says staffers. So then they had staffers and they repeatedly asked Bakay. That's how you pronounce his name, Aaron Bakay? Uh, Dean uh, Backett. Backett? Really? Backett? Back, yeah. Yes. Why not go with the cool pronunciation? Bakay, Let's go with Bakay, sure. Okay. Sure. So, but no, is that how, does he say back it? He says back it? In I Canada, you can choose. It. In Canada, you get to choose, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, staffers repeatedly asked back it about the paper's reluctance to use the word racist, in part because his explanations seem inconsistent, calling it a bizarre. So, they asked him about it, and he said it was a bizarre litmus test of whether they should use racist when referring to Trump. Uh, he argued it was more powerful to avoid directly using that label. In fact, the quote is, the best way to capture a remark like the kind of remarks the president makes is to use them, to lay it out in perspective, he said. That is much more powerful than the use of the word. So his first explanation says the reason why we don't call him racist is because it's more powerful not to. And then this is where he contradicts himself. When asked a few minutes later about the paper's historic use of racist to describe segregationist demonstrators in Arkansas in 1957, he said, I don't think anybody would avoid using the race, using racist in a scene like that. So what he's doing is, well, 
by the first account, racist wasn't powerful enough language to describe Trump. And then the second account, Trump wasn't bad enough to be called a racist. So the New York Times editor, if you feel bad when you read the New York Times because you feel like they're bullshitting you, his own newsroom feels badly as bad as you do because he's bullshitting them just like they bullshit you. Because that's a bullshit answer, what he just gave. So let me throw it to Aaron. Aaron, now, I know this isn't why I brought you on, not your area, area of expertise, but what do you make of that? Yeah, it's uh, wishy-washy. But, you know, everyone here is being wishy-washy like that. Even like that Nate Silver criticism. Yeah. Like, what did he say? He's like, I'm not sure I would have framed it that way. I'm not sure that was the best way to frame it. Like, like that's, the, that's like the furthest that Nate Silver can go to criticize the New York Times. So uh, this is a big problem inside the New York Times right now. They're, there's a lot of people in there that they feel like they're not pushing back hard enough on Trump and they're not calling him a racist enough and that they're being, you know, uh, they're going along, they're being lapdog dogs to power like they always, always have been. Now, what do you, what do you make? Do you do you agree with their criticisms, or what what do you, what do you think about their the, the newsroom's criticism of the times? Well, this is the problem with the Trump era: is that uh, lapdogs for the corporate elite have used Trump as an excuse to not take on the corporate elite. So they basically define power in this country to one person, which is Donald Trump. So as long as they're calling out Donald Trump. And the thing is, the problem with there, it's Donald Trump's easy to call out. I mean, like, like, like it's easy pickings. He's a racist. He's a misogynist. He's a buffoon. I mean, there's a million things you can take on Trump for. And they sort of made Trump the litmus test uh, for whether or not one is doing your job as a journalist and being confrontational, adversarial towards power. The problem is that power in this country goes far beyond Trump. And in fact, the ways power has ruled this country is what gave us Donald Trump because it gave us a bankrupt, corrupt neoliberal system, which Trump then exploited to uh, win election by painting himself as a foe of that system. So the Trump era has created this strange dynamic where you have all these journalists posing as being, you know, uh, uh, champions of truth and taking on power. But really what that means is confining their criticism to one person, Trump, and also confining it to a very narrow uh, set of, uh, of principles. They challenge him on racism and misogyny, which is good, but they don't challenge him on war. They don't challenge him, him, they don't challenge him for basically continuing many of the same policies of the Democrats, including locking up immigrant families, deporting people on a mass scale, continuing all these wars the Democrats uh, uh, either continued or started themselves. Uh, and so, you know, it's, Trump has been used that way as a uh, deflection. So that's why we have to be careful when we're talking about whether or not the Times is being adversarial towards Trump or not. So we were just, that's a great, you made great points. We're just, we just covered a story before you came on in The Intercept about how um, oil company executives are caught laughing and bragging about that they're getting laws passed all around the country to criminalize protests. And so you think that would be the front page story on The New York Times. That is not. Uh, you'd think that that would be the front page story every day for a month if they're actually an oppositional paper, but they are not. They are owned by billionaires. <laughs> they serve the elite. And if you buy a paper, that's good. That's good. But they don't really need you. And uh, what, what, uh, that's, that's how I feel about the New York Times. Um, so let's get to the, to the, so that's, uh, you know, it's nice to see that, that even the, People in the newsroom at the New York Times can't stand the editor at the <laughs> New York Times. Even they are sick and tired of his mealy mouth bullshit. Uh, so it's nice to see that. Hey, come see a live Jimmy Dore show September 1st in San Francisco, September 8th in Baltimore, the 16th of September we're in Seattle. Go to JimmyDoreComedy.com for a link for all of our live dates and tickets. Plus, become a Patreon member. Is that how you say it? Patron. Become a subscriber to our Patreon. That's a great way to help support the show. You get hours of bonus material every week, or you can sign up directly over at jimmydorkcomedy.com, and you cut out Patreon altogether. Thanks for your support.